You're listening to Manx Radio. I'm Chris Pearson. Today, June 14th, marks the 40th anniversary of the end of the Falklands conflict. On April 2nd, 1982, a team of Argentine Marines mounted an assault on Stanley, the capital of the Falkland Islands. Despite a spirited attempt to maintain control by the small company of Royal Marines stationed there, along with the local Falkland Islands Defence Force, the Argentine forces took control. Their first stop was the local radio station, where Falkland Islands radio presenter Patrick Watts was forced to play a tape at gunpoint. Well, the radio station has now been taken over. I still hope that we can get His Excellency the Governor's message to you. Just a minute. If you take the gun out of my back, I'm going to transmit that to you. If you take the gun away. But I'm not speaking with a gun in my back. Back in the UK, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher confirmed the news to a shocked nation. British sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign power. The large task force will sail as soon as all preparations are complete. The early hours of preparing that task force saw members of the British military being recalled from leave, ready to be mobilised immediately. Aidan Forbes, who retired to the Isle of Man, was, at the time, serving as a private with the 2nd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment. I think they must have had... We we always had a recall mechanism of a telegram that would send the name of your barracks back. And because I'm a terrible writer, I'd spelt it wrong. So I knew it wasn't a hoax. It came back. It was Bruneville Barracks and I'd stuck a U in it or a V in it or something. So anyway, I received the telegram and uh, just knew we had to report straight back to barracks within... 24 hours. So you headed back to Aldershot. Presumably at that stage, it was a case of getting your own personal kit together and making sure you were battle ready. We were meant to be going to Belize in Central America. That tour had been cancelled and uh, and uh, we were pulled into Spearhead Battalion and started assembling the, the equipment that we were going to need for, for the actual uh, operation. And things in the meantime, you were presumably watching the news and hearing what was happening, thinking maybe you will be going, maybe you won't be going. I think that there was a general feeling at the time that, that this probably wouldn't amount to much and you might not even get as far as Portsmouth. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, one of the things that, I mean, OK, Paris, we're, we're not exactly, most of us aren't exactly well educated. We all thought, what was Argentina invading a, a little island off Scotland? I mean, it was just insane. And then uh, we looked it up and we found out where it was and, you know, it was quite a long way to go. And how are we going to get there? How are we going to parachute in and everything? And, uh, yeah, anyway, as events unfolded, uh, yeah, we went on a different uh, method of insertion. <laughs> So you got yourself down to Portsmouth, or they, uh, they took you down to Portsmouth. The next thing, you're being uh, sort of loaded onto a ship, onto the MV Norland. What was your thought process? What were the, the boys thinking at that stage? Uh, yeah, it was all gung-ho. We're all ready to go. Uh, we didn't actually take our band with us, but our band was on the quayside to see us off, playing Don't Cry For Me Argentina, of course, which was uh, a big hit at the time. <laughs> So uh, 8,000 miles to the Falklands, but there was a, a stop en route at Ascension Island, which presumably gave you a bit of a chance to, to get things in order. Yeah, the uh, our sister battalion, the 3rd Battalion, uh, they'd sailed before us and they'd got down there. And a lot of the uh, the naval ships, obviously, they they were all ready to go. Uh, we turned up and uh, there was a lot of cross-decking, moving uh, equipment between various uh, ferries and uh, civilian vehicles that have been rec- uh, vessels that have been uh, requisitioned so yeah there was a bit of chaos there and uh, when we found out that we were going to be inserted by a landing craft uh, they brought a landing craft alongside the Norland we all donned big orange life preservers and climbed into it and have a trip round the bay that was our only experiences of uh, being in a landing craft and Ascension, if people don't know Ascension Island, it is quite a sort of tropical paradise, very different to where you were going to ultimately end up. So that must have been quite a pleasant experience. Uh, yeah, the- yeah. Uh, I think more for the 3rd Battalion. They were there for about a week and a lot of the, uh, the marine units. We arrived, like I say, trip round the bay and uh, get back on and we were off. Uh, we didn't actually land on the island. You then set sail uh, for the South Atlantic. 
it's hard to imagine because we're in 2022 and nowadays people have got iPads and phones and there's a way even at sea of keeping in contact with news and family and everything else. How did you guys know what was happening? Uh, we had a, a newsletter that was passed around, briefings from the officers and uh, uh, we have a we had a high frequency radio uh, 320 that uh, you if you turned it onto the UHF band and we used to be able to pick up uh, BBC World Service. So we could uh, we could hear what was going on through the uh, military radio that way. And you needed a friendly radio operator for that, which is where you came in handy, I guess. Well, yeah, yeah, I was a very popular man at that time with the uh, <laughs> HF trained, yeah. From some of the other people I've spoken to who were down there at the time, there was still a feeling, even when you set sail from Ascension, on that last part of the journey, the second and final part of the journey, that it might not actually come to anything. There would be this political solution and the, the ship would then turn around and you'd, you'd come back and carry on with your leave or whatever. Was that what was... Was that your experience? Or? Yeah, I think right up until the moment uh, when the uh, Belgrano was was sunk, that we all thought that there was going to be a political uh, situa- solution. I mean, it was it was an insane war. Uh, but when you look at it, you know, there's basically British people being invaded by a foreign country. Uh, it might be 8,000 miles away, but these people were as British as we are. And, uh, yeah, we... Uh, up until that moment, we were sure there'd be a joint sovereignty solution. But once the Belgrano went down with that uh, loss of life, I think, you know, it was for real then. And then you get within 200 miles, there was a 200 mile exclusion zone around the Falklands. As you started approaching, this is now becoming very real. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've been uh, training on survival, on cross uh, weapon training, and. Uh, Medical training, a lot of medical training going on. What was your first sight of the Falkland Islands? When was the first time you physically saw the islands? We were quite a way off to start with, and uh, we moved in closer. There was a, around the landing position, there was a place called Fanning Head. Uh, that was getting uh, shelled up by the Royal Navy, and we learned out later there was an SAS patrol up there sorting out the uh, the people that were on there. So we, we mounted into our landing craft through the uh, side door. There was no uh, no special way. It was quite a big swell. We lost one guy with a uh, fractured pelvis who got caught between the landing craft and the boat. And you've got to remember that we were going up ashore with full battle kit. So how much is that weighing? What are we uh, talking? Minimum for an infantry guy. One of the one of the grunts in a rifle company. He'd be carrying about 10 stone. As a radio operator, I was carrying my own weight, so I'd be about 12 stone. I mean, that's just incredible, because it, it, hard enough moving between a ship and a, a landing craft at sea uh, with the swell that's going on, but you're carrying effectively uh, another guy on your back. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they gave us the lovely thing, as just as we were getting onto the landing craft, uh, the mortar mort- platoon gave us two mortar rounds to carry on as well. So we actually went up a little bit heavier than uh, yeah, than you, that. You were landed eventually at a place called Blue Beach, which is near San Carlos. And there was a famous instruction or a famous piece of advice that was given. Did you get that as well about how deep the water was going to be? Oh, yeah. We all, we've all seen the old movies, Sands of Iwo Jima with uh, John Wayne charging the shore <laughs> and onto these lovely sandy beaches. Uh, anyway, I was. Uh, we had uh, TAC one, which was uh, Colonel Jones behind us, was with B Company, and uh, the ramp went down. Uh, we were all waiting to run ashore, and uh, there was quite tall ramps on these landing craft, and it just disappeared <laughs> into the water. <laughs> we all looked at it, and uh, the uh, the loadmaster on, the, well, I presume, yeah, whatever the, the Marines called, he uh, shouted, "Troops out!" And we all looked at him and thought, no, 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 we're not going into that, mate. You, know? <laughs> you can't see the bottom. So uh, anyway, at the back, Jones shouted, red on, go. And all that's Wolf Paris, that's uh, their, uh, our signal to jump. So we all ran off this thing into this water that came up with my chest. And uh, my mate Stu, who was even shorter than me, <laughs> we were having to hold his head above water to get him onto a certain point where we could, uh, yeah, where we could actually wade ashore streaming with kit. With, with water pouring out of everything. And you've still got 10, 12 stone on your back at this point, and, and, well, go, yeah, and it, you don't know what you're going into? No, no, uh, we, 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 we met the, uh, the SBS guys on the, on the beach, and uh, they all, uh, 
standard joke, I presume. Oh, we all thought you were going to come tomorrow, <laughs> but they were all waiting for us. So, uh, and yeah. was it dark as well? We just under the cover. Oh, of darkness. yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, yeah, we'd, we'd gone in a, a, a cover of darkness, and of course everything had got wet. So your 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 weight limit's gone up. Yeah, we dropped off the motor bombs, and uh, we were deployed to the top of Sussex Mountain, which was a, a three mile hike uphill from the uh, from from Blue Beach. You use the word hike. Now, the uh, the Marines use the word yomp. Used in the Paris, it's tabbing. What does tab stand for? Uh, tactical advance to battle. So you tabbed to the top of Mount Sussex. What were you feeling at that stage? What was going through your mind? Uh, yeah, the sun was coming up. Uh, normally, we'd, uh, after a couple of miles, the sun was coming up. And we still had a mile to go. We could hear aircraft moving around and uh, we knew we, there was no air defence up. The Argentinians used a twin-engine uh, ground attack plane called the Pacara. Uh, the SAS patrols that were out in front of us, they managed to bring them down with uh, an American Stinger uh, ground away missile. So, yeah, we heard that one go down, and then uh, we just continued up to the top of the hill and uh, came up there and uh, tried to dig trenches, uh, water table was far too high so we got down about a foot and the water just started rising so we built sangers made out of stone and peat and uh, yeah we, we sat up there for a few days and it's pretty unforgiving uh, the territory if you think of North Barul and places like that there's not much to dig into it gets very rocky and bouldery and scree slopes and stuff it's not the most pleasant environment and with the wind howling around it must have been pretty pretty foul conditions yeah yeah I mean uh, I was quite lucky because uh, I was a radio operator. So, yeah, my stack position was beneath the wind, but the lads on the top were exposed to it for getting on for a week before we moved off from there. And, uh, yeah, one of the things that doesn't get talked about as much is the uh, amount of weather casualties we had. If you can imagine after the landing that we didn't have time to change socks, didn't have time to change clothing. So once we got up to the top, then it's all around, all around defence. So guys have been in wet socks for, you know, 12, 20 hours before you can even start looking after yourself. So, yeah, uh, at, at the end of the uh, battle, at the end of the war, uh, we'd lost some of our best soldiers through uh, weather casualties and through the terrible boots that the British Army issued to us at that time. And we talk about weather casualties, and, and, and certainly that side of it I'd not heard before, but... On the flip side of that, some of the, the advances were made. Advances in medical science were made by the fact that it was so cold, and some of the casualties, it's thought, survived because it was so cold, and we're, we're sort of given an extended chance because of that. Yeah, I definitely know that for a fact. I ended up in uh, our RAP, our regimental age post, at one point, and uh, yeah, we were looking after a guy who'd been shot through the kidney. He showed every sign of dying. And, uh, yeah, late, later on when we got back to Aldershot, uh, yeah, he was there, still alive. Lost a kidney, but, uh, yeah, should have bled to death. But uh, the freezing conditions kept him alive. And, of course, Commander Rick Jolly, the Navy uh, surgeon who had the facility, the Red and Green Life Machine, as it became known at Ajax Bay, uh, just incredible. The, the, the theory was, basically, if you made it there alive, you were going to leave there alive as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my mate Denzel, who uh, lost a leg from three para, he talked to one of the surgeons later, and uh, to keep him alive through the lack of blood and the loss of blood he got, uh, the surgeon actually had uh, blisters on his fingers from reinflating, like the respirator, the ball, to just keep blood and uh, oxygen pumping around Denzel's body. I mean, these guys were amazing. Absolutely incredible stuff. So you're at the, the top of the Sussex Mountain? Uh, what happened next for you in terms of the, the battle? Yeah, uh, the nearest outpost of Argentine, uh, the Argentinian forces was a, a place called Goose Green. It's about 10 miles away. Uh, it's a little settlement at the end of a, an isthmus. The isthmus is about three miles long, one mile wide. Uh, we were tasked to go down there on a raid. Uh, the raid fell through, and next we knew... It was a full uh, battalion assault into Goose Green. So uh, that's... Yeah, moved on down to Goose Green. Uh, 
lost guys again through uh, walking across the tussocky grass, various other things as we uh, as we got down and uh, we reorged in a house. Uh, God, Burnside or Camilla, I think it's Burnside House, and uh, we laid up there during the day, waiting for the uh, waiting for the goal to go in that night, and during that night, uh, we had the uh, famous. Uh, BBC announcement. Robert we Fox. Heard, yeah, well, no, no. This was uh, this came from BBC World Service that said a parachute battalion is waiting. A, uh, a w- waiting to attack Goose Green. It was a leak from Whitehall or from the government. No one's ever said who did it. Now I can tell you a bit more about that because right. there was a, a, a guy called Christopher Lee, not the actor. A guy called a journalist called Christopher Lee. He still works for BFBS. He was briefed at uh, Westminster that the attack was going to happen on Goose Green. He said, is this on the record or off the record? There being a massive difference between the two things. And they said, no, this is on the record. So he reported it, of course. And, and yeah, Robert Foxy's oppo was sitting down with you guys, dog him, waiting for the for the next morning. He must have been Mr. Popular that night, I'm guessing. Oh, yeah, I, I do believe the uh, Colonel Jones was uh, was saying that uh, heads would roll when he got back to the, uh, got back to the UK. But uh, well, thanks for letting me know about that. I, yeah, incredible I'm stuff. Me- yeah, I'm meeting all the lads in uh, in, in June, so uh, I'll let them know who, who they've got responsible. It was, it was Christopher Lee who told me that story himself, so it's... It, it, it's true, it's, it's finally it's on record there. Now, so then the attack on Goose Green itself, and we should point out that Goose Green at the stage, did you know that there were uh, Falkland Islands being held in the village community centre at Goose Green? We, uh, I, I can't, I have no, rec- no, uh, no recollection of that. But I presume that, you know, it must probably higher up. Uh, normally I'd, I'd get to know that through being a radio operator, but I, n- I had no recognition of that. Uh, I do know that they severely underestimated the amount of people that were in Goose Green, uh, the amount of Argentinian forces. I mean, even for a parachute battalion to uh, take on uh, three times their number, which it was in the end, is uh, beyond all recognition. It's it's just never been done. Uh, and I do believe the uh, Sunday Telegraph or the Sunday Times, in recogn- it, they, they checked the 20 greatest battles the British Army has ever fought. And, yeah, number 20, uh, they say that Goose Green was the uh, 20, one of the greatest battles the British Army ever fought. So, yeah, I'm privileged to have uh, survived that one. Somebody who didn't survive was a chap you mentioned earlier on, the, the boss, Colonel H. Jones, who sadly lost his life there, along with a number of other people. How did that affect morale, or was it just a case of we've got a job to do, we'll, we'll, we'll keep pushing on? Yeah, by that time uh, we were meant to be fired in by a uh, a Royal Navy ship that was going to support our artillery. We had uh, limited artillery. I think we had half a battery, so three guns, and uh, the motor, our motor platoon. That was our uh, that was our fire support. And apart from that, we relied on ourselves, our, our uh, support company, our machine gun platoons. But basically, we just relied on most would be the most devastating weapon that the British Army's ever invented, which is a, a parachute battalion. You say, and you've got a smile on your face, but it's so true because there's, an hour, there's rivalry within the forces, but the paras have got a reputation for a damn good reason. Yeah, I mean, uh, when you think about our training, by the time a platoon will pass out, you might start off that platoon with uh, 36 men, if we can get six guys from that platoon. And you've got to remember, these guys have already been selected to be available for a parachute training and for a parachute battalion. So you end up in a, uh, once you've got through that training, you've got your red beret, you've got your wings, and you go into most probably the, one of the most violent peacetime places you could ever imagine, which is a, uh, a parachute battalion at, at peace, because there's so much testosterone and course, uh, yeah. everything going around. And then you take that battalion and you put it in a war situation its capacity for generating violence is unbelievable. But it's controlled and it's 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 there to do a job. We're not just talking random acts and whatever. It's it's very much, you know, you're there to do that job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, we, we bring our training and our weapons to bear on inflicting our will on the, uh, on the enemy. So Goose Green ebbed and flowed. It was getting light 
there were various people I've spoken to, guys who were stuck in the re-entrant where uh, H. Jones was uh, was sadly killed, who were talking about the fact that the light was coming and they were now panicking because you were under sort of severe pressure and under fire and stuff. How did you turn that round? Was it just that force of uh, the guys doing the job? Yeah, we. Uh, if you can imagine, uh, you're looking at a mile-wide battlefront. The battalion had normally advanced with two companies up. So we had A Company on the left, uh, B Company on the right, and D Company in reserve. We also have a patrols platoon and uh, a recce platoon and the support company. Uh, we'd already been fighting all night. Uh, we took through a lot of enemy positions, uh, but timings were slipping. A Company on the left, as I said earlier, I was with B Company. Uh, a Company on the left uh, were approaching uh, Darwin Hill, and uh, it was getting light. We'd reorged, you always reorg at first light. Get everyone together and we advanced. A company came across dug in uh, positions at, on the main Argentinian defence line. Took severe casualties actually moving to the dead ground beneath Darwin Hill. And uh, yeah, and things ebbed and flowed, as you said, for a, for a while. And Jones took it on himself uh, to get a small party, mainly of officers together, and to go right flanking uh, around this re-entrant. And uh, unfortunately he died there. B Company on the right that I was with, we were advancing down a hill that was like a bowling ball, and uh, sorry, a billiard table. And uh, we got absolutely malleted from a hedge line. Uh, he went down into a valley, came up the other side, and the Argentinians just opened up on us. I took uh, casualties all the way at that time and uh, we withdrew back into dead ground at the top. Uh, at that time, we were looking at a, trying to look at a way of flank outflanking the enemy. So if you can imagine, the sea was on our right. I remember moving into uh, an area, a rocky area, and... Uh, I think a mortar bomb must have gone up quite close to me. I lost a, a bit of time then, but I remember sitting in the RAP with uh, my officer, Captain Young. He was quite severely wounded. I think I must have got a bit of concussion and a minor, very minor, uh, shell splinter in my leg. I just remember staying with him and treating a few of the, few of the wounded there. At that time, we'd lost Joan, uh, Colonel Jones. And uh, our two IC, Chris Keeble, he uh, he brought up a machine gun platoon, which uh, which was obviously behind, and a Milan platoon, which was our anti-tank platoon, and uh, we used we used the suppressing fire of the machine guns, and uh, we fired the uh, the rocket-guided missiles into Argentinian bunkers and trenches, and. Uh, we uh, destroyed their their line that way. D Company came up from reserve. A Company was pretty much shot up by then. And uh, D Company did a right flanking down the beach and rolled up the positions from, from there. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, we brought C Company in to move through A Company. They advanced over the top and uh, you could see go screen from there. And... The Argentinians opened up with everything they had. They had uh, some 30 millimetre cannons, 20 millimetre cannons, 105 artillery, uh, and they hammered us as we moved down the slopes. We'd all we'd managed to do, we'd gone through the uh, the main Argentinian defence line, but uh, we'd most probably fought through three or four hundred of their men. Uh, we still had 11 or 1200 to go. C Company advanced down towards the uh, Argentinian defences around Goose Green and uh, B Company, uh, we moved round to the right. I should explain that C Company is our patrols and recce platoons. So we've got two understrength platoons moving forward uh, alongside elements of uh, D Company that have come through as well. Uh, we moved uh, with B Company and we moved right flanking. There was an airfield and we uh, took out the uh, Argentinian 30mm and 20mm cannons that were up there. 
and we continued round to the uh, right outflanking uh, Goose Green. D Company and C Company, they'd advanced further onwards and uh, yeah, and night started to fall then. So we, uh, we withdrew and uh, sat in positions uh, at that point. Just waiting for the chance to regroup and, and go again. Go again the next day. The next day, our patrols and D Company basically stood still. Uh, B Company, we moved further out to the right and that's when uh, they uh, started hitting us with the uh, Pukaras, with the napalm. This and is the, the aircraft. The, yes, yes, sorry. The, uh, they came in with a, a Pukara with an underslung load and uh, dropped it on D Company. This is uh, napalm. Now, now, I think this is one of the things that people don't realise when the Falklands War, that the Argentine forces used what is a banned weapon yes. against you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, it wasn't just that. I mean, they had... Uh, they had rockets uh, underslung that would be mounted onto mirages and other aircraft uh, on children's slides in, at Goose Green that they were firing from those. Uh, but yeah, they dropped the napalm at us and uh, the lads understandably took it out on the aircraft, shot the aircraft down. The pilot got out and uh, as he floated down, the guys were taking pot shots at him and uh, Major Neen, to his uh, full credit, I mean, we're all paras. There's a poor guy in a bloody parachute coming down. He might have just dropped napalm on you. So he shouted, stop shooting at that man. <laughs> and everybody stopped. And, uh, yeah, he was took prisoner. Yeah. But the uh, the long the long and short of this was that uh, that Pukara was still in the air and still flying. Uh, by this time, B Company, we'd advanced right round to the back of Goose Green. And uh, I was in a sunken road about 600 metres away from the settlement. We were under quite intense fire there. And we looked round and we saw this flaming aircraft coming round. And we're going, no, 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it bounced. It hit the ground about 200 metres from me, bounced back up into the air and shot over the sunken road and uh, showering us in uh, Avgas, uh, the, 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 the fuel. The yeah. fuel. And uh, God knows how we weren't all incinerated and bounced across. And I remember just looking up and seeing this thing bouncing over my head and just thinking, this, it can't get any worse. <laughs> this is not a good day at the office, <laughs> no, is it? No. So we're laying in there absolutely soaked in Avgas and uh, my mate, Whiskey Will, who was with me at the time, went to light a fag up. And I said, if no. you light that, we are dead. <laughs> I mean, it's a natural reaction, but not now, fella. Not yeah, now. yeah, we just survived that. God knows how. So, uh, anyway, uh, we pulled back to our uh, position. There was no way we could outflank them. Uh, we check that out. So, uh, we pulled back to our positions, and uh, that's when uh, Colonel Keeble came up with the idea of sending in uh, a couple of NCOs, their senior NCOs that we captured during the night, and just saying, you know, you're surrounded. And if you don't surrender, we're going to come in and uh, we'll, we'll sort Finish you out the in the morning. Yeah. 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 And uh, by then, I think that's the first time I knew about the uh, civilians actually in Goose Green. Because they, was, they were, uh, he said, you would be responsible for the deaths of these people. And I'm thinking, I never knew there were civvies in there. Yeah. Anyway, uh, luckily enough, they went in and uh, they came back with the answer, yeah, we will surrender. Uh, so we were looking de where we were on this slight rise. We could look down into Goose Green and we saw uh, quite a few people coming out, marching away, a band playing. They got harangued by their officers and they all undid their, uh, their weapons and threw them on the ground and took their helmets off. And uh, we thought, wow, God, there's loads of them. And then they, their Argentinian Air Force came out <laughs> and there, was, there must have been seven or eight hundred of them and they walked out and they all took the, the weapons off and threw their helmets down and we just thought oh god thank god they didn't decide to fight because we were on our chin straps we'd yeah. been fighting for two days uh, we were out of ammunition um, we are using a lot of us were used, we, we were on the captured Argentinian ammunition by then uh, a lot of us had uh, I, I know I liberated a pair of Argentinian boots and various things. Yeah, it was... Uh, well, they're not going to need them again at that point. You do, so... Well, some of them, unfortunately, got ended up with our boots. <laughs> they, the <laughs> they got the worst end of the deal. <laughs> yeah. They definitely got the worst end of the deal. Yeah. So the battle for Goose Green, 
has been won, but that's far from the end, isn't it, for you? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, so that's, we're looking at 28th, 29th of May, and the final surrender wasn't until the 14th of June. So uh, we moved, we, we, we moved into Goose Green, liberated the civilians, stayed there for a few days, and then we had a, we, we came up with the idea that we needed to find out where the Argentinians were. I mean, if you've got to remember, we're moving around on the right flank, and on the left flank, they've got the uh, Marines and three three para moving up, advancing that way into uh, uh, towards Stanley, and you've got the the uh, our special forces fighting in the mountains in the middle between us. We moved forward to a place called uh, Swan Inlet House with a couple of uh, small helicopters. And we landed and we went in, picked up a telephone and rang up the next settlement, which was Fitzroy, and said, are there Argen- any Argentinians there? <laughs> I mean, this is... Surreal now. It is yeah. crazy. The satellite it? imagery yeah. and as well, but this is what you were doing. Yeah. So we rang them up and they said, oh, no, they've just left. So we went, OK, nice one. <laughs> so we flew back to Goose Green and we commandeered a... Uh, We'd we'd lost most of our helicopter lift because the, the Atlantic conveyor had been sunk by then, so you'd lost all of the the heavy lift, the Chinooks and everything else. It would have uh, would have made it easier, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And we had, I think, we had one Chinook left. Bravo November, a very famous one. It's it's the airframe still flying, but I think it's like Trigger's broom. <laughs> <laughs> no original bits. Yeah. No original bits at all in it, but it's still got the original call sign. So uh, yeah, we commandeered that, and uh, I think we managed to set the the limit for what that poor old thing could take. I think we had 120 guys fully loaded in the back wow. of that. Wow. And, uh, yeah, that rolled... That had I would not ro- want to have been the air, the air load master that day. <laughs> no, no, well, he was going to get overruled, whatever. I mean, he wasn't going to stop us. Uh, yeah, we wasn't walking that far again. No. We'd had enough. So, yeah, we uh, it had, it couldn't do a vertical takeoff. It had to do a rolling takeoff to actually get itself into the air. And we flew forward and we took over Fitzroy. Uh, so we advanced... 20, 30 miles down the coast. Fitzroy, of course, is the scene where uh, the Sir Tristan, uh, Sir Tristan and the Sir Galahad were sunk with the, the loss of life of the Welsh Guards. Had that already happened by that stage? No, no, we moved in uh, Fitzroy. Uh, we took shelter in a... Uh, well, first of all, we moved out into the surrounding areas. Uh, we defended that area, dug trenches, and uh, rotated back through Fitzroy, uh, getting a bit of rest, getting... Uh, we had, there were some sheep shearing sheds there, so uh, it took us out the wind. And, uh, yeah. Because any, anyone that's not been, I mean, the, the wind can be ferocious on the Isle of Man, but in the Falklands, it's something different, isn't it, the wind there? I was I was there for two years in the late 90s, and I think if you added together all of the non-windy days we had over those two years, you'd get less than a week. Yeah, yeah. It, and uh, in May, uh, you've got to remember, it's it's their winter. Yeah. So there was snow on the ground, it was frost every day. Uh, my feet were playing me up terribly. So we, at one point, I was in a Kelpers, one of the local sheds, uh, houses, and uh, he'd run a hot bath for us. Uh, I think I was about fourth through it, and my feet swelled up like you wouldn't believe. So actually, to get my boots back on, I had to uh, go outside put them in cold water to get the swelling down yeah but it was just i mean it sounds insane now what you know the, the amount of pain i was going through with my feet but there was no way you're gonna let it defeat you so uh anyway that was a minor thing for me uh the worst thing was that uh, the five infantry brigade had come down or relievers had sent round uh two of our Two ships, the Galahad and Tristan, uh, are full of Welsh guardsmen, and uh, Argentinians still had observation posts. Could see the masts and the funnels from one of the observation posts, and sent in a flight of uh, planes, and uh, blew the blew them up, uh, causing horrendous casualties to the Welsh guards. Including Simon Weston, who's been here to the uh, to the uh, the island a few times as well himself. Simon and a few others. We were we had a makeshift range going at the time, and uh, the guys went down onto the beach and pulled the guys ashore. 
So from Fitzroy, what then for you? Uh, we were flown forward again. They got some more planes in. We, we basically thought we were, after Goose Green, we, we were a pretty depleted force. Uh, we moved forward to a place into the outer defence rings around Stanley. And uh, we supported our brother uh, battalion, the 3rd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment on their assault on uh, Longdon. Now, three para took Longdon with horrendous casualties. I think they lost 21 dead and 50 or more wounded uh, in the assault. And because uh, they were the first people to take the high ground, one of the high ground around, they were subjected to uh, terrible shelling. We were on the reverse slope. Uh, we were going to move up the next day and uh, the next night and go into our second battle, which was a uh, wireless ridge, but three para just had to sit up there on the hill and take it. And of course, these are Argentinian positions we're moving into. All their bunkers, all their trenches have been ranged, DF'd by their artillery. So they also had a, a 155 artillery piece there that uh, it, just, it, 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 it absolutely tore them lads to bits up there. That night we uh, moved up. We went in on our second major battle, uh, Wireless Ridge. We'd been underprepared and underarmed, under-supported for Goose Green and our new commander, uh, Chandler, had come in, our new colonel, and he said he'd never send us in again without support. So we had uh, scorpions and uh, scimitar, light armoured tanks, and they fired us in. We had artillery, I think we had two regiments on call. We had naval ships, and uh, yeah, we assaulted across a huge bowl. Uh, D Company took the brunt of it this time, they moved around to the uh, another right flanking move, came in against the Argentinians, and uh, unfortunately we had a, a fire gun controller who didn't believe we were moving that fast, and uh, called a salvo down on the D Company, and uh, lost my mate Dave Parr through that, but uh, accident of war. Losing friends, colleagues, comrades through enemy action in a war is one thing losing them through effectively blue on blue that sort of friendly fire that must be extra hard to take at the time we didn't know we didn't know it uh, it came out later i think the lads at the time knew it was the lads from d company we were uh, with our battle with our own battle anyway we uh, yeah it, it is hard to take it, looking back on it is it's senseless it happens it happens in every war I think we've ever fought, and uh, even Afghanistan. You know, it's it's still happening now. It's it's one of those things that do happen. I can't see if you have uh, if you're going to put humans in uh, into positions where red hot shrapnel and bullets can hit you, you. If it's yours or theirs, in the end, it doesn't really make much difference. So we're back. Just to give a little bit of context to this, Stanley, Port Stanley, as it's sometimes called still by the press, uh, is the capital of the Falkland Islands. It's surrounded by a, a, a ridge of hills, Wireless and Tumbledown and Caroline and the others. Where are you now? Are you at Wireless still? Well, you've just moved through. We've, took, we've taken Wireless Ridge uh, and we can see Stanley. We can see the lights of Stanley. Uh, we can see uh, C-130 Hercules is still landing on the runway that the promises have been taken out. Uh, we can see the Argentinians retreating as the dawn came up. We're calling uh, artillery and naval gun support down onto the guys as they were retreating. Uh, we were counter-attacked there by a company of uh, the second battalion of the Argentinian parachute regiment. <laughs> Bizarre. Yeah, they we fought those. Our D company fought those guys off. And uh, then we got the thing that uh, they were suing for surrender. So then it was a, uh, a, off came the helmets, on went the red berets, 
and uh, we did a, a massive run into Stanley down the main road. Uh, a and B Company went, uh, sorry, B Company, we went round right flanking through the artillery positions just to mop those up, make sure there was no one hanging around. And uh, A Company and D Company, C Company went straight down the middle of the road and into Stanley, where we, uh, yeah, first troops into Stanley, first ashore, first to fight two battles. Yeah. And first into Stanley, what did it feel like at that stage? Because you know that all this preparation, all this stuff you've gone through is coming to a conclusion and at some point you're going to be able to go home, obviously. But what was what did it feel like at the time? It's relief. It really is relief. It's just, oh, God, I can put this bloody rucksack down. I can take my boots off and not worry about having to try and force them back on again. And, uh, yeah, and let's see if we can find some decent food because we've been living on compo for... Got three weeks, apart from one time in Fitzroy where they'd given us a, uh, they, uh, the, the islanders had given us a beautiful uh, sheep stew, which went through every one of us like toast. Because like, <laughs> you're not used really, to that food, it's not compo, it's not it going to last. No, no, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> what was Stanley like? I'm presuming it was pretty shot up at that stage and pretty messy. Yeah, the outskirts were. Uh, unfortunately, uh, again, we'd... Uh, we'd uh, one of our, I, I don't know whether it was artillery or a, it would have been one of our artillery strikes and killed uh, two of the locals. Uh, but yeah, we moved into Stanley. It was full of uh, Argentinian, Panard, armoured cars, supply dumps, weapons, everything. Everything you could imagine. It was just stacked up. And uh, yeah, to... Uh, to a paratrooper, all their weapons and everything. It was, it was like a toy shop. Wasn't it? You know, so, yeah. <laughs> we know since in in the stuff that's come out from from the Argentine side that many of those people that were left there would have been conscripts. Some of whom didn't even know they were going to war. Apparently, they were told they were going off an exercise to a Shire, taken off on a herky, landed in the uh, the Falklands, and then said, "This is the Malvinas. We're at war." You've gone from that feeling of fighting them and, and obviously doing the job that you were down there to. They must have looked pretty dejected and stuff. What were you feeling toward them at that stage? It's, it's hard to uh, start loving your enemy after what you've just been through. We uh, we took various work parties and we, we moved them into like the school and that to clean up the, the mess they'd left. Uh, yeah, it's... Okay, they might have been conscripts and some of them, but some of them were good soldiers. Some of them were very good soldiers. I mean, at Goose Green, we had some of their uh, special forces that we'd captured. And uh, inside the berries, they all had a a, a nine millimeter round sewn into the berry. And I says, "What that for?" He says, "Oh, rather than surrender, we kill ourselves." So we have bloody forty five of them in this pen. Wow! So you know, it's they were professional soldiers. Uh, a lot of them were trained by. Uh, uh, they had been American trained. Uh, we came across some of their snipers. Were brilliant, and. Uh, yeah, yeah. One of them had a, an American accent. They found out later he wasn't a mercenary, but uh, yeah. That was the Argentine forces that you came across. What about the locals? What was the reaction of the 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 Falkland Islanders that saw you at that stage? And once they realised they could come back out onto the streets, oh yeah, it was brilliant. Absolutely superb. As we say, it's just like going into a little town in the Cotswolds or somewhere. It it, it they. they 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 had a an almost Devon accent, which was um, amazing, and yeah, and it, it was just beautiful, and uh, they were just so happy to see us, and and I mean, yeah, I mean, it was a at how an Argentinian can have a claim on an island when the population's been there for so long, and still speaks in a Devon accent, and there's no Hispanic or or there's no influence down there apart from. British influence. It's, it, yeah, it, it, it's a bizarre claim, I think. The, maybe because it's on the same continental shelf, but that's the only way I can see that Argentinians have a claim on that place. We'll come back to that in a second. So how long did you spend there then before you were sort of shipped back home? Uh, I think we were there for a week or so. Our, uh, our ship, the MV Norland, was used to transport the pris- prisoners back to Argentina came back again and uh, 
when they were moving us back, they thought it was wise to put both parachute battalions together rather than... Uh, <laughs> Risk put, mixing them with the boot next. Yes, yeah, it was... Uh, yeah, so they uh, they put two and three parrot together back onto the Norland. And uh, as we were sailing back, we had our... Every year, we, uh, we have an Airborne Forces Day when the, the commemoration of when the parachute regiment was formed. And it's normally a wild do but that was most probably some of the hardest fighting we had to do was two and three para on the, on the MV Knoll and coming back. Coming back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it must have also been a surreal time because it must have been the first time in months that you'd had a chance to actually stop and think where your life was and what you'd gone through. Yeah, yeah, it was... I think we are just all just looking so far to getting home. It was just... It just seemed to have gone on so long and we, we really needed to decompress. It was... Uh, yeah, just get us home. Let's get out. I need a beer. I need to go and see my girlfriend. I've had enough. You know, maybe it wasn't the best idea letting us loose as soon as we got back to the UK. Uh, I think the when the guys do tours of uh, Iraq or uh, Afghanistan, they sit them for a week in Cyprus and let them... Bloodhound camp yeah, it, uh, near Limassol. Talk to yeah. Them. Yeah, but, uh, we ended up with a lot of cases of PTSD through just letting the guys loose at the end. Because you'd gone from one thing, you were you were literally fighting for your life, fighting alongside your comrades, fighting the enemy, to suddenly being dropped off in Portsmouth and see you later, fellas. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we we never got the uh, magical uh, sail into Portsmouth, unfortunately. Yeah. The Northern took us to Ascension, and uh, they put us on some uh, planes and flew us back into Bryce Norton, and uh, wandered off, and our families were there to pick us up. Uh, yeah, and later on, we watched the Canberra and. And the fleet coming back in, but uh, the Norland had to go back down there to uh, look after the uh, put new troops ashore. And uh, I think the Norland stayed down there for another six months to a year. You've been back down there as a fantastic organisation, SAMA, the South Atlantic Medal Association. You've been back to the Falklands. How did you find that all those years later? Again, it's still the uh, the welcome of the Falkland Islanders. They really can't do enough for you. They'll take the time off. Uh, they'll take you out wherever you want to go. We went back to uh, Goose Green, uh, walked from the start line to uh, actually into Goose Green, had a good drink with him, and uh, met the farmer at Goose Green. And he says, How come that all the time I'm out there, I'm finding left hand gloves? <laughs> and we're going, Well, when you're taking out a, a position, what you do is you grab a grenade. And you go to pull the, the grenade pin out, and of course you can't do it with a left hand glove. <laughs> so if most guys are right handed, you so you 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 take your glove off, meaning to pick it up later. But of course once the thing goes bang, and you're assaulting through the positions, you've lost your glove. Is that Jen? Yes, this is Jen. So I actually presented to the the farmer I had a set of Northern Ireland combat gloves that we that we wore down there. And uh, I g- he says, I gave him a, uh, a right hand glove to go with all the left hand Fantastic. Ones. How cool is that? That's yeah. brilliant. I gave him the left hand one as well because it was no good to me. <laughs> <laughs> and they are, having spent the two years there that I was fortunate to do, they are the most patriotically British. And, and what you guys did in 82 will never, ever be forgotten. Yeah. Um, Margaret Thatcher Way and, uh, yeah. The hospital with the Union Jack painted on the top. and Yes, everywhere. I'm, I mean, we have... PTSD sufferers that that will go down with uh, summer. They get concessionary flights through the uh, through the area through the government as well. And every time we go back, it's just like, yeah, it, it, they are just so grateful. Still, it's forty years on, and yeah, I mean, I can't think of anywhere else where the British Army served, where people are just still so grateful for going down and liberating them. You eventually settled here on the Isle of Man. I always say to people uh, who've spent time in the Falklands, military friends, they say, what's it like on the Isle of Man? I say, and I mean this as a compliment, it's the Falkland Islands on steroids. Yeah. Because it's the scenery is just as spectacular. It's fantastic. The sea, the cliffs, the, the mountains, but there are nicer restaurants and bars and everything else here. I think that's a fair description. But what was it that attracted you to, the, uh, to, to come and live on the Isle of Man after all that? I'm a biker. <laughs> yeah, I ride with the Moddy Doom, uh, part of it. Um, yeah, it's it's just a place to be. It's just the the friendliness of the place, and 
it's an island. It it, it just you you it's insular and it's safe, and it's a beautiful place to live. And uh, yeah, I, I couldn't think of dream of living anywhere else. Do you ever find yourself? I certainly do. If I'm out by myself for a walk or something, and, and walking up South Barrel or whatever, thinking this could be the Falkland Islands. Yeah, especially up on up on some of the terrain, up up on the the flatlands, up on the top, you know, between the mountains, and you're walking over tussocky grass. We used to call them baby heads down there because <laughs> they were the worst thing in the world to try oh, and walk oh, over because oh. you break ankles and yeah, and you twist your knees at all, all times. And you try doing that with twelve stone on your back. Not easy. Falklands at 40, Aidan, right now, looking back on your time, would you do it again? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. It's It was part of Britain. The Falklands is part of Britain. The British people down there. Yeah. If I had my youth again, I'd be down there again. And even if the outcome was different, even if I didn't come back, I'd uh, certainly be down there fighting for them. 